According to Dr. Lisa Moscone, the number one risk factor for Alzheimer's in women is their hormonal health. Yet it still isn't something we don't talk about enough. Lisa is a neuroscientist, holistic healthcare practitioner, and her research is well known regarding the early detection of Alzheimer's disease in at-risk individuals, especially women. I'm so excited to have her back on the show to discuss the fascinating updates in the space, specifically when it comes to menopause, which despite what many people think is a process that can start in your 30s, and it does not happen overnight. If you haven't listened to our 2020 episode with Lisa, I highly suggest you head to the show notes to give it a listen. This one will get you into the weeds a lot more. And today, she discusses what every woman should ask for at the doctor, what we're getting wrong about Alzheimer's genes, how women at every stage of their life can protect their brains, and so much more. So in the book, you say that most women spend 40% of their life in menopause, and by 2030, 1 billion, 1 billion with a capital B, 1 billion women will have entered or about to enter menopause. So what do we know about women and what's going on in their brain during menopause? This is such a fascinating question and a question that I think we should all be really mindful about, in part for the reasons you mentioned, that women are half of the world's population. And menopause does not happen overnight. So it's really important to realize that menopause, number one, does not happen when you're old. That's a misconception. The average age globally is 49. So that strains at the definition of old age by any standards. And most importantly, you don't just happen to go through menopause. It's not like when you have your period that just one day hits you and that's the end of the process. Menopause can take years. Transitioning to menopause and the absence of a menstrual cycle can take anywhere between two and 14 years. And what we know about those years is that they can be easy, but they can also be hard and demanding, especially on women's brains. And that is really the big part of my work. It's a key component of my work to study the menopause brain, what it means, what it does, um, why it happens, and how to feel better as you navigate those important years. So what are some of the things that are happening if this starts years before 49? Maybe we start in our 30s. Can you walk us through like what's happening in the brain and 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and beyond? Like, what, what should women be aware of? What, they, what should they be looking out for? Are there labs they should be demanding that their doctors give them? Mm-hmm. So they should think about this as a process that actually starts as soon as we're born. Because the truth for women's brains and women's bodies is that we are born with a system the neuroendocrine system that connects the brain to the ovaries. We're born with it. However, this system is activated as we go through puberty, then is overactivated as we get pregnant every time we are pregnant, and then it gets partially turned off after or during the transition to menopause and more so after we are in menopause. So the way that this process impacts your brain is that everything is fine until you hit one of these very important transition states, which I call the three Ps, puberty, pregnancy, perimenopause, which is the transition to menopause. Those are neurologically active states. It means that your brain is just as impacted by these processes as much as the ovaries are. We're just not used to thinking about that as a neurological process or something that impacts your brain as well. So that is important to know because a lot of women are really scared of menopause. They're really confused. They don't know what's hit them. They don't associate the symptoms with the process of going through menopause, in part because they feel like I'm not old enough to be going through menopause. I'm in my 30s. I'm in my 40s. What is this? It's actually menopause. It's a process that takes many years that impacts your brain in ways that are subtle, 
but consistent. And you may have seen some of the symptoms as you go through puberty or pregnancy as a woman. They're just stronger, sometimes more severe as we go through menopause. So when women say that they're having hot flashes, night sweats, insomnia, depression, anxiety, brain fog, brain fog is a huge concern, memory lapses, those are symptoms of menopause they don't start in the ovaries, they start in the brain. Those are brain symptoms that are triggered by the way that menopause changes the brain. So one one I want to spend a moment on. So you mentioned brain fog. Yes. And I'm sure a lot of women are going to equate brain fog with possible early cognitive decline in the form of dementia and Alzheimer's and they're, and they're freaking out because more women are more likely. Yes, 60%. Exactly. And so how does one, these are some of the symptoms we feel, what can women do in terms of lab work, whether more specifically, it's like looking at hormones, like what should they demand of their doctor to really zero in on the symptoms and make the definitive connection that these symptoms are indicating that I am going through perimenopause or um, a year away or two years away? How, how should they approach that? Yes. So that's a really good question. And they, I'm going to talk for a couple of minutes here to really answer that thoroughly. <laughs> okay. So actually brain fog is, what, is the reason that we started to look at menopause and the effects of menopause and brain health. Because as you know, my, my expertise is in Alzheimer's disease in the prevention of Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And we were getting all these women in the program who were in their 40s and early 50s saying, I think I'm experiencing early onset dementia, which is a big red flag for us because early onset dementia, the way it is defined clinically, it's very hard to manage. And then it turns out more often than not, the, the symptoms are not dementia, they're actually menopause. They're just so hard to tell apart. So we have come up with a system that addresses the brain fog and is able to clarify whether or not this menopause is something more serious that can impact you down the line. This is something that's not being routinely done because menopause is... A, is not the best term, perhaps, but it's been pigeonholed as an issue with the ovaries, right? The brain component is usually disregarded in our medical field. And therefore, women of menopausal age will go to their ob -GYNs. But ob don't do brains. They are not trained. It, it's just that they can't. They cannot. They're not supposed to be managing or diagnosing anything brain-related. In fact, most ob are actually not even trained to manage menopause in the first place. It's one in five. Whoever receives any menopausal training in the United States of America is one in five residents who get any training at all. I, I just want to pause there for a moment. That's a pretty big, essentially every, every woman in the world who who is fortunate to to live to a certain age goes through menopause and they will go to an OBGYN and you're telling me that only one in five OBGYNs ha it has actually the necessary the, <laughs> the expertise in this thing and they're in that, that's a pretty problem not even the expertise it's one in five residents who retreats who receives any training at all wow but the training could be like 10 hours in total which is not enough. So should women just like not go to their OBGYN when they're experiencing, or are they, are they better served going to, because this is a big, this is a big deal. It's a problem. It's a problem. But the way that you find the right person, the right specialist for you is that you need to ask for their certifications. So OBGYN, OB I say OBGYNs, but um, the specialists who have been trained to manage menopause are usually certified by the North American Menopause Society. So you just look for their qualification. You ask, are you a menopause specialist or not? Every woman who's listening, write that down. Do that. It's very important. There aren't that many. So it's really important to find the right specialist. So anyone in New York City, I would recommend Wild Connect Medicine in part because I work there, but in part because we have a midlife clinic where 
all clinicians really specialize in menopause care and they work with us for the brain component. So we have this integrative approach with women who are really concerned about brain fog, memory lapses, um, reduced focus or concentration, or just feeling like hot on brain, or we call it mental fatigue, brain fog or cognitive fatigue. They can come to us for testing. And what we do, so the blood work may or may not be necessary for menopause because the levels of hormones fluctuate very widely until you are in menopause. But the difficult years are prior to that point. So once you no longer have a menstrual cycle, the system, the neuroendocrine system, the brain hormone system is still a little bit in a flux for like two to three years. But then usually things start to settle down and like estrogen bottoms out and progesterone is very low and other hormones called FSH and LH are increasing. And that in a way corroborates the diagnosis of menopause. However, if you don't have a menstrual cycle, you are in menopause. You know, there's not much more that the labs can tell. Labs are more helpful when you're younger in case of primary ovarian insufficiency. Like women who are like in their 30s or early 40s and are having, just don't have a menstrual cycle or don't have a regular menstrual cycle or are having trouble conceiving. In that case, those tests are helpful. And also for women who undergo menopause for surgical indications. So once you have your ovaries removed before the, the age of menopause, then that is called surgical menopause, and it's a different process. It could be more severe, and sometimes tests are helpful because like, if you had your uterus removed but not the ovaries, you will not have a menstrual cycle anymore. Or in case of a procedure called endometrial ablation, which is helpful for women like with endometriosis sometimes, then you no longer have a menstrual cycle, but you're still having your ovaries so the system is still active. You're not actually in menopause. It's just hard to tell these things apart. So it's important to go to a specialist who can really guide you and tell you where you are on the menopausal spectrum. For your brain, I think I strongly advocate for women to see us, like brain specialists, people who can do cognitive testing on you at a minimum, right? You're worried about your cognition come come to us or other um, centers who can do a cognitive testing on you. Is there a directory for those, you know, we've got an audience all over the world. Is there a directory they can find online that people can help them here or, or things they should look for in a practitioner or questions they should ask? So there are Alzheimer's prevention clinics that are now emerging throughout the country and also in Europe. I think there's one in England I can send you the links so those that I'm familiar with. We'll link it link in the show notes. Thank you. Yes, great. There's um, a wonderful center in Cleveland, like in Las Vegas. Yeah, I'll send you I'll send you the links of all the clinics I'm familiar with because that I think is really helpful. You know, more than a blood test, they can't tell you much about anything at that point. Come to a come do a kind of test. Get a brain scan. I do brain scans on all of our patients and participants, and it's extremely reassuring for them to know whether or not there's something in their brains that could be a trigger for those symptoms. Because if your brain is fine, then you can really relax. And we also have a good baseline. So we can keep repeating the brain scans to make sure that there's nothing ongoing that just didn't show up on the first image. So in terms of brain scans, come get one. The, the full body scans are, get, are getting a lot of attention, specifically Pranuvo. Colleen and I are going to do ours in a couple of weeks. Uh, would that be something that would show up in a, in a full body MRI, which they're also imaging the brain, or is it something more specific for those interested? It depends what you're looking for. So the total body scans are really good for cancer and for early detection of structural issues. What we find uh, in our research on menopause, we're talking menopause, yes, not cancer prevention here. Menopause, yes. For menopause or cognitive changes, then the changes are not, they're more functional than structural. So a stru an anatomical image will not tell you much unless you have a very severe issue like a stroke, uh, infarcts, 
or you have a lot of atrophy, or there's a tumor in your brain. These are all things that we also screen for. But then you want to do functional sequences, which is what we add on top. So we look at blood flow to the brain. We look at connectivity in the brain. We look at metabolic activity in the brain. And most importantly, we look at Alzheimer's markers. Because if you don't have the markers of Alzheimer's disease, then your risk of having Alzheimer's disease are basically different. And, and remind us, can we do a, just a quick reminder for everyone, what are the markers of Alzheimer's in terms of genetic testing that people should be aware of? Right. So there's genetic testing, but there's also biological markers. I was thinking biological markers. So Alzheimer's disease is defined uh, pathologically by the presence of very specific lesions in the brain. There are the Alzheimer's plaques that everybody's heard of, most people are familiar with. And then there's another marker, it's called neurofibrillary tangles, or just tangles. It's a different protein that kind of clumps up inside the neurons and damages your brain cells from the inside, whereas the plaques are in between neurons and interrupt communication. And now we can measure these markers in the brain by doing brain scans. We can measure them in the cerebrospinal fluid by doing a spinal tap, but we can also measure them in blood. So this is very new. Wow. What's, what's the blood? I'm assuming what's the, the specific blood that someone can ask their doctor for? So not all doctors can prescribe that. However, if your doctor is able to do that, then you can use like a lab like Quest. There's a good company that we like. It's called C2N. I have no conflicts of interest. I don't know them. These are just the companies we use. And you can ask for the Alzheimer's early detection test. And they will check. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, it's just the blood work. It just really just is the same thing as going to your doctor. But I want to be clear that it's not something anyone can get done easily at this time. Your insurance may not cover it. So there are there are things to consider. A good way is to be part of a research study or an Alzheimer's prevention clinic that can probably do that for most people. That's an incredible for people who, who really want to take take this to the next level. Yes. And for genetic markers, the one mark, so there are, can, can we talk about this for a minute? Because this comes up so much in our hands. There's so much confusion around what it means to have the bad Alzheimer's gene. And I think something happened on television that may have confused at least a lot of our patients. So there are genetic mutations that cause Alzheimer's disease. Those are the bad Alzheimer's genes. We know quite a few genetic mutations, but the, the strongest ones impact three specific genes. And I, I assume nobody's ever heard about these actual issues that these, these genetic mutations that cause Alzheimer's disease. They are mutations in the amyloid precursor protein in the presenilin 1 and 2 genes. They run in families. And they're highly penetrant, which means that if you have the mutations, your chances of getting dementia are very high. You may develop dementia at a young age, in your 30s, 40s, 50s, early 60s. All right. So these are genetic mutations. You don't get them from 23andMe. You have to go through a doctor and do a serious CLIA certified lab work. It's a double copy of the APOE, right? Am I, do I have that? It's a complete different thing. This is what people think is the bad Alzheimer's gene. That is not a mutation. So let's clear this up. So what do people think and what's accurate? So people think that the apolipoprotein E, APOE gene is the bad gene for Alzheimer's disease. I would like to clarify it, that there are genetic mutations where you have an actual issue in your DNA, and then there are genetic risk variants. And I was just explaining that to my daughter the other day. So <laughs> I should be able to do it. <laughs> it's a very precocious daughter. Your daughter is nine. She's learning about genetics. This is amazing. I love that. Yes, yeah, so my husband works in biosafety and biosecurity. So this is the typical dinner conversation. But okay, genetic, no, it's, it's true. It's, it's bizarre, but it's true. So genetic mutations are things that happen to your DNA, where your DNA is structurally changed. There may be one piece missing, then one 
maybe one piece has been duplicated. There's something that happened to your DNA that should not have happened. And it happened to you and your family and could trigger Alzheimer's disease at a young age. Then there are genetic risk variants, which means that every person has different versions of the same gene. So this apolipoprotein, this ApoE gene comes in three different forms of variants. There's a, they're called epsilon from Greek, right? So there's epsilon two, epsilon three, epsilon four. You get one from the mom, one from the dad. If you have two copies of the E4 or even just one copy, your risk is higher relative to another person who does not have it. So people have the two or three copies. But it doesn't mean that you are going to develop dementia. There are plenty of people with an ApoE4 gene who do not have dementia. And there are plenty of people who don't have the ApoE gene, ApoE4 gene, who have dementia. It's a matter of risk. It's risk and balance. Just to build off that, it's an important point. We believe, you, you know, your genes are not your destiny. Exactly. Everyone's got a family history they're not proud of or not or not excited about. Let me rephrase that, whether it's cardiovascular disease, cancer, obesity, you know, cognitive decline. And so for those people, I, I, we'll come back to lifestyle because I think that's an important part of this conversation. But before we go there, just to close the loop on on labs, I think you've provided some incredible resources in terms of hormonal health, is there anything else that women in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and beyond should be asking for beyond, you know, a basic hormonal panel? Or is that, and and making sure they have the right physician who's who's trained? Is there anything else they should be demanding from their doctor? Yes, they should be asking about options because menopause comes for all of us. And it's really one of the very few scenarios in medicine where suffering in silence is not only accepted, but it's actually encouraged. When women go through the physicians, the providers with their diagnosis, if you will, 